Hello and welcome to this month's Austin Wednesdays. I'm Lizzie Dunford and it's an absolute delight this month to be talking with Sam Causer, very well respected and experienced architect, about the history of Jane Austen's house or the building that we now call Jane Austen's house. Whilst it is preserved for immortality for the eight years of its inhabitation by Jane Austen, it has a really interesting history and structural history and architectural story around that, doesn't it Sam? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Would you like to introduce a little bit of your work and what you've done at Jane Austen's house? Thanks Lizzie. Um, yeah, we've been um, working uh, with the museum for the last three or so years, uh, looking into the history of the house and also the current condition of the house. Uh, so that brings in both uh, material and fabric issues about timber decay and that sort of thing but also uh, social issues and how the building has been used over time. Um, and as a conservation architect, we're particularly interested in that relationship between the material fabric and the social fabric and mm -hmm. how the two consistently through centuries uh, in all buildings uh, support and, and help each other along the way. Um, and sometimes you see changes in society which are then mimicked or or supported by changes in the fabric and sometimes it's changes to the fabric of buildings which can then uh, bring about some kind of social change and you know I, I, I've done quite a bit of research into different cities uh, yeah. Berlin and Rome and how they have different as different political regimes come in how those regimes can lay out uh, a kind of spatial territory in which the political ideology uh, feels more comfortable yeah. Um, shall we say, and that's sort of obviously acute in Berlin. Um, but, you know, right down to the scale of a little house, you can see uh, one of the most clear things at Jane Austen's house was how uh, the, the, the sort of the windows shift yes. around. And as uh, a certain room in the North Wing, let's say, used to have a window over the courtyard to the east when it was for probably male servants, and then suddenly we find a window opening up to the west over the garden, which would have been probably for the curator's sitting room. So this kind of east-west courtyard, you know, and, and the mud and muck, or the, the nice sunny Pretty garden. garden. You <laughs> yeah. know, so just in a, in a change of a window, you can feel that sort of social change. Mm. And also in the front elevation, um, we think uh, in, in the late 1700s, when briefly the house was uh, a pub, um, probably with rooms over, it had very large windows facing onto the village. They were probably open most of the summer, so almost there was no boundary between the, the main village square out the front and the inside. And then when the house uh, was for the, the Austin family, um, Jane's brother, Edward, who owned the house, um, very nicely, uh, blocked up one of the main windows and put a new window facing over this sunny garden to the west which is much more private and also probably uh, made the other large window on the right hand side of the front elevation much smaller which and that's then onto the dining room uh, where we, we think J Jane Austen wrote her novels and wouldn't want such a large window being looked at with a, a quill <laughs> at the table. Um, so yes, <laughs> that's a long answer to it's uh, fascinating. Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, so we see at Jane Austen's house um, a sort of continual history of it being a public, then a private, then a public building, and this change of use and sort of coming through the windows, the way that the building looks out on the world and people can look in on it, have really reflected its change in social status and history and things over, over the centuries as well. Um, and it is over the centuries because this is an old building isn't it we are it's at the moment it's a in some ways a museum of, of the regency era when austin lived there but it's got its roots much deeper in time than that hasn't it it's um and my office is certainly very old in places yeah the, there's um there's been quite a bit of work um done on research and history of the house uh and hampshire county council have been very good at that. Uh, the head of historic buildings at the time, Peter Davis, really sort of began that work, I'd say, uh, looking at the historic fabric of the building, uh, which he dates back to uh, late 1400s or, or early 1500s. 
Um, and it's interesting to relate that date to 1550s, which is when the Knight family built the uh, Chawton Manor House that, that, that we see largely today. Um, so the two, you know, building the house as a farm might have coincided Inside with the big new manor house and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. possibly. Um, so, so his work was, was really important. Um, and then later on, um, Jane Hurst, a local historian, did some amazing work looking through um, more social records, so occupancy titles and, you know, thinking about exactly how the house has been used through time. Um, and she focused quite a bit on uh, what I call the tenement era. So after the Austin family moved out around 1845, when Cassandra died, um, we think the, well, we know, the house was divided into four separate units. That was three, what were called then poor cottages, uh, and one village club room, which is a lovely concept. Uh, and so we've, um, well, Jane Hurst did some work looking at what that might have looked like and was really careful to separate what, what's guesswork and what's sort of evident in the fabric. Um, so we picked up from Jane Hurst's work and, and Peter Davis' work to then um, sort of see where the gaps are and see what we could do to, to bring you know, social and material fabrics to, together to, and, and also identify what more research is needed by you know, scraping away at the layers of paint so you can identify the age of certain timbers, although that can be misleading because sometimes you find timbers have been moved from elsewhere or, you know, were taken down and stored in the house and then put back again. And there's a bit of that that's gone on, we, we think, that walls that may have uh, been taken out uh, after the Austin family left and it was turned into tenements. And then we think even brought back again. So the, the, many of the walls that we see now I think were there when Jane Austen lived in the house, but I think maybe haven't weren't Always. there for a period. <laughs> yeah. The floorboards are so interesting, aren't they? The way when where you think a floorboard should normally run in that direction, you'd be in a room and then suddenly they cut off, or there's you know they all come to a point, don't they? And you think, well, there must have at some point. You can see some of these areas where there would have been a wall at some point. Um, yes, you can read a whole history in, in floorboards. Yeah, that's, that's yeah the, that's really fascinating actually because there's, uh, and the floorboards are the key to one of the main mysteries as I see it of the house, which is the front door, um, which we're, I, I, I put a tenor on it. Uh, <laughs> a Jane Austen the, tenor on it. A Jane. <laughs> absolutely, of course it is. <laughs> Um, I put it on the, the front door used to be in the middle of the house and we've done a little quick Photoshop image to, to show what we think the front would have looked like in, in Jane Austen's time. And we think it was in the middle and it would have led into the what's called the vestibule now, you know, the front hall with the front door it makes sense. And you turn right into the dining room or left into the drawing room. Uh, and then when the house was turned into tenements, um, we, we, we've gone to some length to show how and why it would have been sensible to move the door to the right so that it leads in directly into one of the tenements, leaving the old vestibule to be part of the club room. So I think that's, it's recorded, that's the room where they played darts and the bigger room, now the drawing <laughs> room, was where there was a billiard table. And getting back to floorboards, we can still see in the dining room, we can see on the floor a scar of where the, um, in the tenement era, so this is of 1845 onwards, there was a temporary timber partition wall put up so that you walk into the front door into a narrow hallway to, towards the middle of the house. Then there was a door into the dining room. And all of that you can see in scars on the floor. And then when it became a museum in 1947 to 49-ish, we think those walls were taken out. Um, and there's a similar story of a wall in the what's now the library at the back. Uh, we know from uh, the, the notes by Pamela Barber, who lived in the house. She, she gave all of her record notes to the museum in 2019, I think. Um, she describes how there was a wall in that room that had a pantry in it. Um, and I don't think you can see the scar on the floor, but we do have photographs of that wall yeah. from the 1940s. Um, so, you know, we have 
social record and photographs and we can see it on the floor so I get very excited. There is a, there is a ridge on the floor there's definitely in that room there's definitely a something there's something there um, which is really okay. interesting. So it's this kind of forensic piecing together of evidence that I, I found very exciting. <laughs> Well, we're going to actually go on effectively a time travel today, aren't we, Jada? So if we we're going to start in the present and move back in time through all these layers of history. So I'm picking what a visitor might see when they come to the house today and then going through to find, the, if we can, the original core of the house. Um, so today, how would you officially, professionally describe Jane Austen's house. I, it's, it's, for me, it's an amalgamation of different things that's grown over the era. But how would you, how would you sort of officially describe it in its modern style and setting? Well, I, I'm not so into um, labels. I think it's a very complicated building, as many village houses are, and it's grown over 500 years to become what it is now. Um, and, you know, we, we, we think working backwards, it's, you know, from museum to flats, or tenements, back into uh, a house, uh, and then going back in time, a pub, and before that, a farm. We think it was probably a farm for uh, 200 or 250 years. Um, and we've... Uh, so we, we, we've tried to describe that in, in one image. We've made a sort of 3D um, aerial view to, just to describe those four main stages. Um, and this is all, it's very much work in progress. You know, I, I, I really think, uh, well, so far benefited in our work so much from different people's input um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, so I, I, I sort of share this work in, in the spirit of, you know, we, we don't, <laughs> we certainly don't know everything. There's an awful lot more to know. Yeah. And I think the more eyes and brains on this, the, the better. Um, it is surprising in a way how, how little has actually been written down, put in diagrams before. Um, you know, so it, it's quite exciting to, to, to be doing that now. Um, so, Back to um, how we tell the story in a more detailed way. So we, these four basic stages we've uh, modeled three-dimensionally um, and we, we've made these models so that we can lift the roof off. So each era has three views, one with the roofs on and then we lift the roof off to see the ground floor and, and then the first floor. Um, and so if we, I've got a, copy in front of me and if we, we'll probably show it on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look now at what the house as it is now, uh, we've shaded in a colour the parts that we think are new to this particular era, helping us, you know, when we visit the house to, to, to understand its, its sort of layers. Um, so the, the, the obvious additions, that, well I should say to, to begin with, that the house as a site is in two main parts. There's the, what's called the main house, which, which is where the uh, sort of museum is. And then the facilities, uh, the support facilities and the shop and so on are in the old outbuildings. And then tucked to the north on the garden side of the old range of outbuildings is the learning center uh, from 2009. And that's the newest building on the site and it's been nestled in designed by Hampshire County Council architect to copy the the old what we think might have been a laundry building or maybe a place for drying laundry indoors it has these mm. strange flaps on the wall as though you know you could hang washing in there discreetly perhaps so so you get the wind but not the rain so maybe you know it's, it's guesswork but yeah. And it's next to the bakehouse, which would have been baking 24-7 probably, so it would have been warm. Mm. And so, you know, it's actually ideal drying conditions. Um, so uh, the, the, back to the present, the other, the other new interventions we think, you know, in the last 50 years are uh, the staff accommodation at the northeast corner. Um, and we think uh, what's now called the alcove, perhaps 
didn't have a front on it when it was built. And it's, it's quite a new bit of building. Um, yeah. We'll look at that in detail later on, but we think it's, it's certainly early 1900s and no older, probably open fronted. And because the, the brickwork in the Gable end looks older than the brickwork in the yeah. front facade. Um, so probably open. Um, and then other in the main house on the ground floor at the north end and what's currently the staff kitchen, those facilities were put in and there's a little toilet for staff there. But very it's a very little change really um, since um, the, the, the tenement era. And if we look at the first floor now, um, again, very little change since tenement era. We, in the main house, we think there are some well, I'd be interested to discover more, let's say, rather than I think at this point, whether some of the walls at the southwest corner, that's the bottom of the page, um, yeah. were perhaps taken out to make that tenement work and then put back in again mm. when it became a museum. I, I would be interested to see that and we'll look more at that later. And also there's a wall in the above the kitchen which we think um, perhaps is, is quite a late addition, maybe 1950s, maybe when that was the um, curator's accommodation, that they would have probably wanted a, an extra bedroom up there, yeah. um, hence putting that wall in. And we know the window overlooking the garden wasn't there in 1947 because we have photographs and it's not there. <laughs> So, yeah. and it seems the reason you would put a window in that wall is because you put a wall dividing the other window of the to garden. Create a room. So probably those two things came at the same time. But yeah. you know, it is guesswork that, but it, it, you know, it makes sense. And often when things make sense, that is what happened. <laughs> um, but you know, paint scrapes and so on will be able to tell us more. So let's uh, move on. If we go now to the tenement era, um, uh, there were, you know, again, sort of minor changes, we think, uh, from um, when the Austin family moved out. Um, so this is uh, about a hundred year period from the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s. Um, and we pretty much know from looking at um, uh, village plans and so on, that that garage alcove part was was added between 1909 and 1937 um, and it we notice it's got a chimney in it the new part and why would you put a chimney in a little large fronted thing you know it's probably yeah. a space to park a, a car even you mm. know depending how, how you know the social status a park or a carriage of sorts and then somewhere a, a sort of warmer place for the person that looks after the car to, to, to either live or make a cup of tea or something. So, yeah. you know, the fireplace denotes heat source mm. and the, the form of the garage denotes parking a vehicle of some sort. So, you know, more work to be done, but that's probably what it was. Um, another change at the north end of the north wing of the main house, um, you can see very clearly in scars on the facades that what used to be a um, a hipped end became a, a gable end and the, the likely reason to do that is you're turning a, an unusable loft into a bedroom space um, and we will look when, when we get inside at, at how that would have worked um, and also uh, on the back of the main house there's um, sort of rather large bit of extension which seems to only provide one loo it might have been as at the moment it's it's a landing off the stairs and a loo it may have been built as just a little washroom mm -hmm. and the door would have been straight onto the stairs but um in in the sort of museum era regulations might have meant that you couldn't have that door on the stairs so they formed a landing with a loo off it um that's more to look into there but we think that little washroom block you could call it was added to support one of the tenements if we look inside at the ground floor, I've color coded to show uh, the four different demises and green is tenement one, which is a two story, quite nice, um, quite nice little house really, sort of terraced house you could call it with the main staircase. And then in blue is the village club, 
and that would have been um, entered off the garden door, what's now known as the main front door to the museum. Um, and you can see it's, it's quite separate from the rest of the house, yeah. even though the doors would have been still there to the other parts of the house. They're probably just locked shut. You know, I, I don't think it would have been anything more fancy than that. And then in the sort of orange colour, sort of indeterminate colour, uh, is another two-storey um, tenement, which became the curator's accommodation. And it was that until the 90s or so, I, I think, when the curator finally left uh, and everyone <laughs> breathed. So, no. um, so and, and what also gets really interesting is how the house continued a kind of flexibility. So we know that the vestibule area uh, where darts would have been played, um, apparently, uh, was also at one time part of the, the green area. So just yeah. simply by opening or you know, locking doors, it would have been worked in a different way. And we also think that for some of the time, the manager of the village club um, would have lived in the yellow apartment, which is mainly upstairs. So they would have then snuck through that back door between the blue and the yellow areas and up to their up to the private space. accommodation upstairs. So there's this lovely flexibility about the building, which you can you can certainly still read today because the, as we saw the changes since this period are, are, are quite minimal. Yeah. Um, and that's one very interesting point actually about the, the, the yellow tenement, the tenement two, I think we're calling it, and how, you know, how do you get into an upstairs apartment without sharing the main staircase? Well, it's that period, we think post 1845, when that back staircase was put mm. in. So that's not a staircase Jane Austen would have known. We, we think it would have been just a kind of back servant's passage, connecting the kitchen and the cellars and the, the yard, sort of slightly removed from the public village mm. side of the house. Um, but that back stair very sensibly um, provides an entrance off the yard straight into what we think was the sort of washing kitchen mm. area of tenement two and then you'd go up the stairs and if we now look at the upstairs yeah um in the yellow area so that you, the, the stairs come up into what I, I suspect and I was interested when I later saw Jane Hurst's work and, and she also thought this I think well if we both think this then we probably <laughs> sound like it. Yeah, you would have come up those stairs into a quite large parlour. So that's a combination of what's currently the um, upstairs vestibule yeah. with the Austin Treasures room. Um, into so, and be, because we know at this at this point, a, a new fireplace was added, and you can see upstairs um, in that upper vestibule you can see a fireplace blocked up on the wall and it's quite a large fireplace. Um, it is actually, yeah, which, it's a substantial implies, space. You know, it, it was to heat a reasonable sized room. So where is that room? You know, it only appears by removing some of those walls. Yeah. So we, we sort of followed our nose with this. We thought, well, what happens if you remove that wall? You then realize you've got actually quite a lovely large parlor off which is two perfectly serviceable bed chambers or bedrooms or, or, or whatever. Um, one of which at the north side of the house facing over the courtyard. Again, th there would be no need for the, what's currently a dividing wall. So we, we question, would that wall have been taken out or not? We don't know. We'd need to look at the fabric of that wall and look at the, the stud work and see how it's joined mm. into the floor and the ceiling to know if it's been taken out and put back in again. But certainly if I were Edward Austin in 1845, they wanted to make a decent apartment, I, I would have taken that wall out. Yeah. And I would have also made a doorway between the parlour and the, what's now called the, the Admiral's room. So we can see uh, on, on your amazing uh, um, 360 photosphere walk around the house or in person, of course, you can see the architrave around that door, which it seems to be new, it's sort of mm. modern. It's not a historic architrave. It may be an old opening, but for some reason the architrave was taken off. It might have been used somewhere else. We don't know. So I'd love to pick apart that and try and understand the, what's happened there. But it's certainly an odd doorway. Mm. Quite low see. as well compared to the rest of the house, isn't it? It does 
I agree. It does. It doesn't feel with the rest of the flow. It is from a different time. Yeah, so that it does feel. So it could be eighteen forty-five. Um, and also, if I were Edward Austin at this time, I probably would have blocked up the doorway between the current door between the admiral's room and the corridor because it yeah. would have just gone into that other bedroom. So I'd, I'd love to poke around there as well and, and see. You know, all of this may come to nothing, but I think the, the, what we're identifying is points, you know, very specific points to investigate further. Um, and you can also see in this diagram the um, how the front door has uh, is in the right hand bay. Yeah. If we go back to the ground floor, you can see the, um, the front door of the green tenement number one leads into a hallway with the wall to your right, which was since yeah. removed, um, and then into the back staircase lobby and the pantry at the back, and then probably they did the cooking, which is now the library. And mm. I, I think from memory, there is a, a little cooking range in there. There is, that, yes, um, in the fireplace. It, yeah, so it's probably tenement era, but not older. Yeah. So um, where all this was leading really is to try and understand the house that Jane Austen knew, you know, ta-da, this is the exciting bit when we, yeah. we now, you know, make a stab at what that house would have looked like. Um, so from the outside, um, uh, we can see, you know, very little change actually from tenement era, except the garage alcove isn't there. And we know that from the, the historic maps. And also the north end over the kitchen it has its hipped mm. roof from the gable end. Um, but, and also the other exciting thing, the front facade. Um, so this is with the door put in the middle of the front facade uh, with two large windows either side. We know the left-hand one was blocked up and Jane Austen mm. recorded in letters about that happening with the new window facing the garden on the other side of the room. Um, but apart from that, quite unchanged, although actually one thing we think, well, again, we'd like to investigate more, whether the barn on the east side, the long range, which is now the shop, um, sided. And there's just a little mark on one of the, um, one of the historic maps. Uh, it's a sort of S shape, which we think indicates a gateway or a, a, a connection through something. And this barn has that wiggle as though it's mm. a, a pass through to the, you know, the fields to the north yeah. and the east. Um, or I think next door was a, a blacksmith, if, yeah. if I'm right. So maybe there was, you know, some relationship between the, the farmyard and the blacksmith yes. next to it. There, there would have been yeah. a lot of relationship going on. There. So that might, we're, we're guessing at this point, that building might have been an open sided building at the north end, at the mm. south end, it's it, it's brick. That might yeah. have been, you know, your lock-up shop mm. space. And we know the very bottom corner of that, the south corner, is a, is a historic toilet. And yes. that was the kind of little way you'd, you'd sit on a seat and it would just go down into a hole. And you probably would have, you know, people know more about these things than I do, but throw in straw and stuff that makes it sort of, biological chamber which sort of breaks down the, the nasties but what, what we found has also happened is called subsidence so over you know centuries of excrement Use. in that corner <laughs> have the, the building to to collapse mm. and to do some stabilization work down there um and anyway, when we found out it was a toilet it all made sense you know <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it um, so let's lift the roof off and go to the ground floor of Jane Austen's house that she knew. Um, so one of the main things, we see the front door in the middle of the plan leading straight into a hallway. So you can bring your fancy village friends into the hall, right into the dining room, left into the drawing room. And when you enter left into the drawing room, beautiful view of the garden. Yeah. You know, it's a very carefully choreographed passage. Mm. Um, interestingly, the going into the dining room, there's more connection with the village, something about eating being a slightly more public affair than the drawing room, which would have looked only over the relatively private garden. Um, and then 
uh, another main change, we see the back passage uh, beyond to the north of the drawing room, between the drawing room and the kitchen. Um, a very useful service passage, um, which has at the right hand side the entrance to the cellars, and at the left hand side the entrance to the garden. Now, you might imagine you'd have boshed a, a doorway through into the kitchen, that would have been sensible. But we know from Jane's letters that she describes the kitchen fireplace as very smoky. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> that might explain why there was a ne never a door yeah. put in between Except the kitchen it. and the house, because it would have filled with smoke. And we know that's a very old fireplace. Um, we think it's probably the original 1500s fireplace. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they would have been doing in that, whether that was the original kitchen to the farmhouse, I don't know. Um, but not a very efficient chimney. One thing we definitely know is that the chimney over those 500 years has got a lot taller. So perhaps when it was extended upwards, it just wasn't done in a very uh, flu efficient Fluid. way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Jane's letters about cooking and smoke inhalation and, and wondering why the house is slightly ordered to go outside to the kitchen, it all maybe comes together. But what I do wonder is whether instead of going out through the garden entrance, um, that the staff would have gone yeah. through the courtyard entrance. So we know there was a door between the kitchen and the yard directly. You can see it in the facade on the 360 view or in person. You yeah, can it's see blocked it up. up. And it may well have had some kind of roof canopy protecting so you didn't have to get wet. Um, so that roof canopy would have stopped the direct smoke transfer, but kept people dry. Um, so again, a bit of a close look might reveal whether you can see just little nail holes or little blocks of brick that would have been um, blocks of timber, sorry, into the brick that would have held a, some sort of canopy. A similar canopy actually to the one that we know that used to exist over uh, um, where the where, around where the well is. We know yes. there was a little from 1940s photographs, a little timber lean-to with I think a, a clay tiled roof. It might have been something like that. Um, what other exciting things can we see? So uh, the we can see the off the uh, what's currently the library of the house, we can see that block isn't there. And we know from no. that it wasn't there. And also the quality of the bricks is very different to the rest of the house. Um, so the staircase access is different as well, isn't it? Is it different um, little? There is, well, inside the house, there's a, a door at the bottom of the stairs. Yeah, thank you. So that, as you come down the staircase, that's, that doorway is pretty important to Jane's house, actually, because it currently, to get to the staircase from what was the front hall, you would have had to go through the dining room, as you do now, into the staircase hall and up the stairs. Now, before that door at the bottom of the stairs was blocked in, you would, instead of gone straight from the front hall into a, a sort of inner hall beyond a uh, this little archway over yep. which might have had curtains which really separates I think the, the front public rooms from the back private rooms you know everything beyond that archway and curtains was either where you sleep or where you you cook and clean so yep. you know fancy village people wouldn't have gone through those curtains probably no. um, so, and also that would have meant that the dining room could be much calmer than it is yes. today. A, because it doesn't have a front door in it, and B, yeah. because it's not on the route between the stairs and the hallway. So I think it's quite important to bear that in mind that that dining mm. room would, in Jane's time, when she was writing it, have been quite a calm little room with only the one, um, uh, well, I, I think it would have had both doors, beg your pardon, one to the stair hall and one to the hallway, but there would have been no reason to pass wouldn't through. Wouldn't have been a through traffic, wouldn't, wouldn't have been a through, through passage, no. it would have been a quiet space. And I suppose that as well lives cre gives credence to the, the story um, that she made sure that door was kept squeaking so that she could 
know if she was interrupted and I think that's one of the great questions we had if people were coming through she'd have been up interrupted all the time but if it actually oh, that right. is a step to set aside space that then makes that make far more far more sense rather than it yes. being on a route yeah and I, I think probably uh, again to be researched that that front door which is now into the dining room is probably the same door in the same frame that used to be oh really well, we remember the, the, the year this was done, 1845, Edward Austin's trying to make best use of this yeah. house as poor cottages. You probably wouldn't invest in a in brand a new, new front door. door. Away yeah. the old. I think, so I think with that mindset, you, we've, we've tried to sort of see what how you could achieve the ends with the you know leanest means. Yeah. So probably we find that, that door. And I, I don't mm. know, perhaps one day it gets shuffle back into position <laughs> um so let's look upstairs now yeah. um, um and i think very little change from the house that we see today um mm. the now in one of jane's letters she describes the house as having six good bedrooms yeah. and now I, I i would guess that that must not include the two or so attic rooms, depending how you count them, yeah. or the room over the kitchen, because suddenly it would turn into a sort of eight or nine bedroom house. So I'm not sure she counted interesting no. certain rooms as, as good. No, bed. that's a Jane Austen and servants is a whole other topic, <laughs> but it is interesting. Yeah, fascinating topic. No, I would agree with you with it. And it's interesting when she describes those six bedrooms, and particularly with the layout of the house today um where they're just sort of not there on the ground so this diagram is absolutely fascinating to see them almost reinstated so the working clockwise from the tops of jane austen's room the room we think jane and cassandra would have shared we don't think any change at all uh and then mrs austen's room at the front or top right of, of this uh this drawing again no no change as far as we can see uh the admiral's room as I said, we don't know if the door would have existed or not into the left-hand front room. I, I did wonder this morning if, well, let, let's, let's move on for a second. If we go continue clockwise around the, the, that little room. Now, that's a fascinating room because we, we can see in the way the existing chimney was built. There's a bit of a crack between what we think was a new fireplace to heat the tenement to parlour uh, and what we think was an older flue. So we, we suspect the, the drawing room fireplace below would have risen up and shimmied to the right as a single flue. And that flue uh, isn't big enough to have had another place in it. And it was quite common for maids rooms or secondary rooms at the mm. time to not have a, a, its own fireplace. It was simply heated by the heat of the fire below with the flu passing how through. How interesting. It. So yeah. that, you know, appears to be how that room was heated at, at that time. And if it didn't warrant its own fireplace, that might have meant it was a maid's room. Mm. And now if that was a maid's room, th there might have been direct access um, straight into, and not as this diagram shows in fact, directly through that doorway into the bottom corner room, which might have been like dressing and bathing room, mm. off the room which is now called the Admiral's room. So it may have been a sort of main suite, if you like, yeah. sleeping in one and then bathing and dressing in another, served by the maid or, 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 or manservant coming in from their own little room. So those three could potentially work quite well together. Um, so that throws into question that, that little kink out of the corner of that smallest bedroom that, that may not have existed at the time. But again, material investigation will, will tell us more. Um, and then if we continue clockwise, the room next to the staircase, um, funny, tiny little room mm. um, with, with a very curious fireplace that I, I don't understand yet, but you know, it's great to always have more to know but yeah. there's the tiniest fireplace buried into the wall and we I mean, forgive me it's not shown on this diagram although it may be by the time it goes online yeah it's in the the wall facing the the courtyard tiny little thing it's absolutely minute thing isn't it buried in the depth of the wall and from the farm 
yard view on the 360 view, you can see the scar yeah. of different Quite bricks. a different colour brick, isn't it? Yeah. Really different colour bricks. So I don't know if the, the heat has made them a different colour or if they've been replaced because they were damaged because of the heat, um, because it's such a thick, it must just be one brick thick yeah. there. So there's certainly been some, you know, something interesting. Something there, isn't there? Yeah. And then swinging around, looking towards the staircase, still in that room, is what I think might have been an older, larger um, fireplace, which is currently covers. Yeah. And that's above uh, what might have been a fireplace below in an earlier configuration. Mm. So, but, you know, I haven't totally got a clear vision for, for what that might might have been, but so there's more to do. Um, so I think that's uh, the last bit in um, over the kitchens. Prob I'm, I'm guessing at this point that's probably the room where the the male servants and I, I think the Austin family had two male servants. Is that right? Yeah. So that's yeah, probably where they slept, and the, yeah. the ladies' maids probably in the attics. That that would be my my guess at how those social relations might work, and then maybe one of them in, in that little room we were describing earlier. Yeah. Um, so, and, and currently the, well, the, uh, at that period, the little room in the attic over the north end of the kitchen would have either been just an attic over that room or a taller ceiling. Uh, mm -hmm. If that had been some sort of scullery, sort of space for hot air to rise might have been useful you know, for steam to escape and so on yeah. so that we think is what that sort of looked like that's fascinating they, uh, um, and there's one last bit of the story uh, which we haven't looked at in great detail partly because the evidence gets thinner um, and you know sort of documentary evidence and because pre Jane Austen there was just less mm. writing going on there's less writing about it because it it, it wasn't Jane Austen's house. It wasn't Jane Austen's house, then. No. Um, so, and, and, and here we do, we we think slightly differently to um, Peter Davis, Hampshire <laughs> County Council, and forgive me, you know, he's done an incredible job. When we looked, we, we, we'd like to investigate a slightly different version, which is mm. that, let's say the main house uh, um, was very similar to many other houses in the village, the same as the one right next door called Clinkers now, and many others, which is a, it, it's a small two up, two down, basically, with a back lean to, probably added later. Um, and it probably have been thatched. Um, so you'd, you'd probably, as a farmhouse, you'd probably, the main entrance would have been off the farmyard to the north, yep. you would have entered. There may have been a hallway running front to back, so a, a village door and a yard door, that kind that of That was quite next. common in Tudor house constructions, wasn't it, of bay houses? You'd have the front going right the way through because they were so, yes. there were such almost mini, mini factories. That's a very poor choice of words, but they were so self-sufficient, the Tudor home, weren't they? So that connection between public and private and creative and um, not creative space. That connection between public, private and self-sufficient space was much more open in that era, wasn't it? We're going all the way through. So which makes yeah, sense. it's a little bit almost like a social diagram from yeah. yard and mud and animals through to yeah. village gentility and sort of changing oh. that as you pass through, don't you? Yeah. Um, so we think you would have come in from, from either end and there'd have been yeah. one room with a fireplace on the right and another room with a fireplace on the left. Um, we think if it were two storey, almost one and a half storeys really, because the, the top floor tends to be up in the, in the thatch. Um, yeah. So if it were two storeys, the staircase would have had to have been in, those, in that volume. So we think there probably was an older staircase at the front of the house. Yep. between those two rooms and when we look on plan in a minute we'll see where that kind of well no but yeah no we did do some plans we haven't done a 3d version of this inside yep. it's too complicated yeah. um but be, and that idea that there was an older staircase somewhere comes from looking at the existing staircase which is clearly you know late 1700s early 1800s yeah so you know there must have been another one somewhere uh, and it does make sense in the middle of the plan. 
Um, and then the other buildings um, around the range, uh, the, the brew house, uh, we mm. you know, have totally consistent tour with, with Peter Davis on that. And then the, uh, the bakehouse at, at the north side, what we did there is just took off what, what's clearly an add-on, the, um, uh, well, it's currently your office. I don't know, I don't know what to yeah, call that. Yeah, it's linking building. it through, isn't it? Yeah. It seems to be a, a storeroom. So the lower yeah. part is half sunk down. You know, that's quite a lot of work to sink down. And you normally there's do quite that. Deep, there's quite deep, there's quite deep brick built cellars under that, underneath you, that. You space normally do there. that because it's cool. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's like that, it, it was probably some kind of food storage mm. space. Um, ancillary to the the main cellars under the, the main house so yeah. you know whether it was for a different kind of storage I, I don't know and then above that there's a sort of half story up so that, if you remove that bit you then get this lopsided building with a gable end and a hip turn and I think, well, that doesn't look right so we mm. tried flipping it and suddenly it's exactly the same form as the brew house so yeah. it was probably two very simple hip thatched roofs around a central chimney probably you know that would be our guess and then probably an open-sided barn yeah. um for farm tools and you know farm produce to, to be stored in um so that i think is probably what it looked like when it was a farmhouse those original buildings um and we've got to the <laughs> <laughs> the end of our, our story, I think. That. I just think that's fascinating to see this space and to, I think it's one of the things I find so interesting about the history of this cottage. You know, I, I always feel a bit funny calling it cottage because it's really quite a large house by modern standards within the context, within the context of Pemberley. It's very small, but within the context of most domestic lives. But to see that, imagining those thatched cottages around a central farmyard, and that's the origin of them and this space that always has been or this home has always been very busy very in some ways actually very public apart from those years that actually the years that Jane Austen were there was there was living they were actually sort of almost the most private it was and um, because it was a pub for quite a while wasn't it for a long well we, we think maybe only 10 to 15 years from oh. sort of 1780s for yep. for till 1790 something when the house was leased to the estate bailiff, which is a sort of estate manager yeah. um, called Bridger Seward. Seward? Yeah, something like that. Something like that, um, yeah, Bridger Seward. So it's probably, well, I'm, I'm guessing it was around that period where the house yeah. may have undergone that major change from sort of farm structure yeah. to house. And, and the estate um, bailiff would have been quite, you know, it's quite a fancy job. Yes. So you would have needed quite a fancy house yes. and it's where people, tenants in the estate would have gone to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that room would have been the current library, you know, it has its yeah. own door off the, the yard. Um, and it's you know, not the drawing room and it's not the dining no. room. No, it's got lots and of cupboards as well, porch. isn't it? Yeah. And you can see the original porch and the brickwork at the back of the house. So that would have been where the, each tenant would have waited to be let in probably. Um, so we've gone off on a sidestep again. <laughs> um, but so the other period it might have transformed, you know, like a butterfly from farmhouse to village house, um, could have been when it was turned into a pub. But that, you know, it's a major investment, mm. major. And it clearly, because it didn't last more than 10 or 15 years, failed probably. Yeah. Um, so it might have been a sort of over ambitious and one reason for thinking that was that those two large windows at the front of the house yep. and it just doesn't make sense as a house to have such large south facing windows mm. you know large south facing glass that means overheating apart from anything else yes yeah, and as a get very warm. Room, it would have been very difficult yeah but as a pub they would have been open when it's warm mm. so it, it, it's possible that someone had sort of slightly over ambitious ideas yeah. and bought this farmhouse turned it into a pub spent too much money on it <laughs> and 
and then it failed and then it you know it became I think there were a couple of murders there as well is it anecdotally I, which I, maybe it was quite a maybe it was quite a disreputable I pub <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I haven't looked much into that. No, I don't know much, but I think the family did, the Austin family did know that there had been some, some so maybe it's, it is being on that corner of the road. And I think that's what's also very interesting is some of the, the difference between Chawton itself and the house then and now is that was the main road um, between London and Winchester. It had been very, very busy, um, full of stagecoaches. Mm, although it turns out not. No, yeah. Um, one thing I, I should say, one of the reasons why when the house did that major transformation would have been when it was a, a house, not a pub, is the, the investment in the quality of the fabric to, to look like a dignified whole. Mm. And now we know, we can see that the west facade facing the garden, and I suppose facing people as they went from Winchester towards London, um, that facade would have been a hodgepodge of bits of brickwork and old timber frame and whatever, which would have looked a bit of a jumble bumble. But yeah. what they did is, is, is cover the entire facade in what are called mathematical tiles, which are basically tiles which look like bricks. And when you look at the facade, you think, what are you talking about? They're clearly yeah. bricks. But you look at the corner, the front southwest corner, and you can see oh, the, the beautiful section of the, and we'll, we'll pull up an image of that. Um, so, you know, so what the, the point is some effort was put into making that facade very yeah. clean and unified. And if that were to be a, a pub, you know, that, that's quite an investment. Mm. Um, as a house, it, it, it sort of, you know, the economy of a person wanting a fancy house, it sort of works. Um, but yeah. as a fancy pub, it's it's probably more investment than than one that was would necessary. Have made. Yeah, that's uh, faster. And I think there's also some really interesting parallels with you know two particular bits in Jane's novels with the houses. Um, she talks a lot in she talks in Barton Cottage and Sense and Sensibility when they move in there. That has a central vestibule and hall with two two rooms either side, and it has a chimney that smokes. Um, it's set in the Devon countryside, so it's not it's not Chawton, which is interesting, but there is certain similarities in the uh, topography of the building between Barton Cottage and Chawton Cottage, which is fascinating, given the time when she moved in, the first thing she writes after she moved in. And then there's a lovely bit as well in Persuasion, which makes me wonder how much of this story of the house she knew where the um, lord of the manor, well, the manor's owner's son is given a farmhouse that has been lately been prettified into a cottage. Amazing. Which is so fascinating. So having this conversation with you, I'm sitting there thinking all the time of this Musgrove's cottage. So he married, they took this farmhouse on the estate and put it into, you know, I think it's been lately elevated to the condition of cottage is the actual, you know, which is when you look at the house she was living in, it's fascinating with its origins. So whether it was something that was very common happening at the time or she knew of the history of her house, um, I'm not sure. It's, it's so lovely how, you know, so typical in the 18th and 19th centuries that these the sort of jumble bumble old situations and buildings would have just been given this sort of slap of hate, <laughs> kind of stick a fancy facade on, just yep. the, the way they would have stuck a fancy dress on and a wig yeah. and suddenly they're ready for the for the world it, it's yeah. it really you know architecture and social life being the same thing really yeah, so absolutely and, you know, that sort of theatrical ability of architecture in, in that period is it's very refreshing there's, there's a lot now of feeling of authenticity to mm. to material and you think well 200 years ago they had no problem oh they didn't care did they no, we've got this old medieval hall house building. That's fine. Let's just stick a brick front to it. <laughs> put a new no, neoclassical yeah. front on it. Today, no, hysteria. But it's interesting that there's difference yeah. in that social change that you see in the house. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted, we've talked a little bit about um, paint scrapes. Through it. This is partly, partly because it's something I'm really interested in. And I just wanted to sort of, for those of the, those people watching who didn't, know um, some of the techniques of pulling back through the histories, looking at, you know, obviously dendrochronology dating, looking at the 
the structures that are, are left in the effectively sort of vertical archaeology, isn't it? But the actual paint research and the research instrument, that's really important for defining and determining the history of a building, isn't it? And telling about more about it. It is. It's uh, when, you know, a building is treated like uh, an object in a museum. So here you've got a, a building as museum, which is a really interesting category of, of museum. Uh, it, it, it carries all of the change within its fabric. Um, and, you know, paint scrape is literally uh, some very careful people picking off bits of paint from areas that, you know, that, that they've been advised would be the right places to do it. And they can then analyze them in all sorts of scientific ways to, to look at each layer of time. So each time it's painted, that paint is still there. And they can analyze what the paint is made of, which then links it very much to known technology of the times. So you can date quite accurately um, each layer of paint. And when, when you, you, you sometimes find you, you can go so far back and then it stops because the paint had been scraped off. Yeah. Um, and now there's a, there's a sort of conservation debate going on about whether you know, these buildings are two, three, four hundred years old, where you should keep applying new paint on top and keeping that yeah. archaeology. Yes which is hiding the plaster work or timber work below it. The details are disappearing under these yeah. you know, 30, 40 layers of paint. Wh which is better to preserve, the archaeology or yeah. the, the original appearance? You know, I, I, I said the answer, but I really enjoyed the question. No, it's a very, it's interesting. And I have, I have seen through, um, I've looked at paint samples through microscopes and it's so interesting to see and there's particular paints that you do find in the Regency and find this area because of the change in techniques. So, um, one of my favourite that I've saw was, the, was smalt, which was to get the blue, which is it's ground up glass used in the pigments to get it. So it's, you can see and judge and there's all sorts of clever things you can do with chemical analysis. But it's so fascinating to know that you, these tiny, tiny little chips of paint can help determine yeah. the work that would, you know, can change the whole course of history of a, of a building. Um, and yeah. our understanding of it. The sort of chemical composition of paint is you know, a fascinating story. And of course, the, the, going right back to the use of blue in paintings and, and the Renaissance that was, was reserved for you know, Mary because it was the most precious yeah. color to make because it was made from crushed lapis lazuli, which is a very expensive thing mm. to do. Um, diverging a bit, but um, what was I going to say? Sorry, that's my fault. I completely, I, I love paint scrape. I did, I used to do, I did a bit at uni and I just think I find it so fascinating. So I just, I thought it was interesting to share with people how you get those, get that information because we've mentioned it a few times and actually that context of how it works. So yeah, sorry, that's my fault derailing you. <laughs> and you, you can, oh, I remember. Yeah, so you can do the same with, with wallpaper as well. Um, Often it's the same specialists who, who know about wallpaper. Um, and I think you've done quite a lot of work at the house. We have, yes. Recreating in, in traditional ways the, the wallpaper from fragments hiding behind shutters and things like that. And shutters are a good, behind shutters is a good place to, to people who've been slightly lazy in their painting for a long time and bits that don't show often hide, hide the true treasures, don't they, behind the scenes. Yeah. And often preserved because the, the light doesn't, broken down the colour. Um, what, I, what I was meandering towards is uh, an, another form of study that can be done on houses like this. You, you can actually extract smell molecules from these. Really? Layers. Yeah, and there are people, specialists, that can, through the layers of paint or wallpaper, whatever it is, understand how the house would have smelt in these different Oh, periods. that's fascinating. Yeah, it sounds a bit far-fetched, but there are companies that do this. <laughs> so it would be amazing to understand what the house would have smelled like, you know, the smell of Jane Austen's. Uh, I can't, uh, yeah, it would be hilarious. What was Jane Austen's house smell like? I suspect it might be slightly less ink and rarefied than we would like. I suspect it's very sooty. And that's, that again, we were talking about the fireplaces. I think that's one of those things that's so interesting that when we visit 
when we all visit historic houses and we visit those spaces, we don't see them almost through the lens of smoke and through that, you know, the smell of wood smoke would have been predominant. We have a lot of fireplaces at Jane Austen's house and the, there had been ash and, you know, there would have been the servants were there to keep the place clean from lot of, the want of for a lot of other work. Um, but it would have been very different atmosphere, wouldn't it, going into the smell of coal smoke, the smell of the cooking from the fire. And the cleaning products. It would have been, you know, several hours a day just keeping the dust down and products to make, you know, people people would have stunk 200 yeah. years ago. You know, they, they didn't yeah. bathe every day and it would no. have been a really smelly place. Um, Talking of smells, I suppose that is a question, a very indelicate question, but do you think that um, we do get asked to the house, particularly by small boys um, of all ages, but where would have been the domestic offices, let's be euphemistic, during Austin's time? Do you think it still would have been in the in in the outbuildings where it is now? Is that a Victoria? Or, uh, would they have been there? When you say domestic offices, do you mean... I mean the loos. I mean the toilet. Uh, loo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we know there was that one outdoor loo in in the um, in the long barn. I I don't know the date of that. I don't know how old it is, but that it's it was into a hole in the ground implies it was before um, Basil Jet and the, yeah. uh, and, and the and the main sewage systems, uh, which were put in in England generally around the eighteen fifties, yeah. um, and that's when some of the very careful mapping. Of Britain was done because they were specifically interested in in where the, the sewage facilities are and the point of that is it's about cholera and about the spread yeah. of disease so you know fascinating to think in, in current times about how architecture and urban planning transformed dramatically like beyond what we you know anything we can really imagine now because of a health crisis yeah uh, you know the, the billions that would have been spent laying underground pipes to every yeah. single you know house workshop office in the entire country underground pipes you know huge extraordinary endeavor isn't it to combat disease yeah yeah and um, so around the 1850s that's when we start seeing these outdoor loos you know a special room for a toilet and if you've got a pipe of course that pipe has to emerge somewhere somewhere yes. fixed so this is the difference between a potty under your bed yeah and a room in which you would go to, to do your business. Um, so in the 1850s, we see the proliferation of little outdoor spaces, and they were generally outdoors, I, partly, I suppose, because it's easier to get a easier. pipe outdoors than to get yeah. it into your house. And it was only, you know, really much, much later that when houses were built after 1850 that you start having indoor facilities. Indoor because when you build the house, you can then build the pipe where you want it rather than yes. at the end of the garden. Yeah. Um, so in Jane Austen's home, it, I, I would imagine they, they would have just had a potty under a, a bed. Um, often in houses of this period, you've, you have these strange little tight cupboards really mm. between rooms. So between a drawing room and another fancy room, there's quite a fat wall with yeah. secret little doors and, and they we think would have housed little potties ah. for when you're at a social function. Yeah. You just disappear into that little room, do your thing and so a descendant of a garden robe from the medieval and, castles. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. So my final question, we've kept you talking. It's been absolutely fascinating. I wanted to ask you a question. What would you love to find in a paint scrape or archaeology if you know what would be your dream archaeological not archaeolo your archaeological architectural discovery at well two questions at Jane Austen's house and anywhere you know what would you love to find um hidden behind a door or under a skirting or well or in an attic at Jane Austen's house I would I would you know it's a very simple dream I would love to know exactly what colors she surrounded herself with I, I suspect from you know reading bits that she's written and so on, that she would have been quite instrumental in, in the colours of, of the rooms. Um, we know the wallpaper, but we don't really know the, the colour of the, the paints yet. Um, and I would love that they were a little bit out there, a little bit <laughs> surprising, 
Uh, if they're anything uh, like the green wallpaper in the dining room, they definitely will be. <laughs> um, and I would also love to be able to extract the smell yeah. from that That's paint. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And so we can really understand what it yeah. would have been like to be in that room. And that, of course, we would approach it with our modern brains. Yeah. So, you know, how one accesses the sort of physical world around Jane Austen through visiting the house is really interesting. Yeah question of how you you do that as a sort of is it a fully immersive experience and it smells and it's a little bit grubby and there are people scurrying around when you're into room cleaning or yeah you know that's what it probably would have been like or or is it more museological and, and mm -hmm. step back and the sort of information that tells you something rather than yeah. a direct experience and that that difference is fascinating. There was a, mm. a conference a couple of years ago organized by the, the previous director of the yes. Jane Austen's Museum, Mary Guyatt, who is specifically looking at the idea of house as museum. I think mm. there were six case studies and each has approached that question slightly differently of, you know, is, is it immersive or is yeah. it- um, How much is it the, ob people? yeah, how much, and also how much is it the object? How much does it become? Does it or does it become a display case? Where does it sit on that spectrum? And are you, you know, are you stepping back in time or are you, yeah, are you reading it? I suppose are you living it or reading it? Is a very yeah. way of putting the it. Major yeah. problem with that though is you have what is it, sixty thousand visitors a year, whereas yes. in Austin, you know, as a house, it probably would have been more like a hundred. <laughs> so yeah. it's sort of major, you know, health and safety infrastructure. <laughs> Well, yes, we won't be lighting fires everywhere, which is uh, <laughs> the, the the fires back just yet. Of all those people walking on the floorboards and yeah. touching things, you know, it's a very, very different situation. So it's mm -hmm. a, it's a complex world, and I, you know, hats off to you for managing that that process of getting people inside a museum yeah. object is, is tricky. Yeah, it's interesting. And the other question, what would you love to, in any architectural build, you know, if you're looking at a project, what would you love to discover and find out? What really do you, does fire your interest in, in architecture and historical building? Well, it's going to sound a bit romantic probably, but, you know, we find this at Jane Austen's house where, and in any, many buildings, buildings which have adapted themselves to support the inhabitants in, in whatever whatever it is they want to do. Architecture that just sort of shimmies around and you know opens itself up or makes a private space or a view of a garden. It, it, it's almost like acts of love from the building to, to the occupants. That's which beautiful. I find very beautiful. That is beautiful. That's a really beautiful and I think I one of those I mean you'll know this working with historic buildings and working in them from us, they are living things. That's not too trite a thing to say. They are, because they have been lived in for so long when these buildings do have their own personalities, they have their own space. So I love the idea of them adapting to fit purpose. I, mean, I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. well, they're, they're not, <laughs> I would qualify, they're not, an, you know, they are inanimate, but they're yes. such close mirrors yeah. to the people that yeah. make yeah. them, maintain yeah. them that have the enjoyment of living in them and passing yeah. through them. You know, these sort of four bodies of people, yeah. their, their presence is very much felt yeah. in, in, in the buildings. So they're almost animate, I would say. Almost, yeah, that's better than my very romanticism. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sam. That has been the most fascinating discussion. I know that I will be going back to the house and looking at things in different ways and also understanding a lot more why there's some weird diagonals on the courtyard that don't make a lot of sense. But um, thank you so, so very much for that and for helping thank us to lift the roof off and explore the building through time. Thank, thank you so much.